Well, you know who Albert Einstein is. I am talking to sports media's version of Albert Einstein. Think Stop of him. It. Think Stop of him. It. Think of him, Dan, as the godfather of ESPN college basketball coverage. He heads now Steer Enterprises. This is Dan Steer. He comes well recommended onto the podcast, the Onto Something podcast. Clearly, his career. He has been on to a lot of different things. And we're going to talk about that. I'm Brian Fenley with Fox Sports Radio on Twitter at Brian Fenley. But this is not just some Q&A about his career. We're going to go in depth about his life, learn about him as a human being and what makes him so successful and why he's positively impacted so many people and what the root of that is for him. Dan, I appreciate you doing this. Obviously, you're fresh off the Olympics. You've worked so many years at NBC and ESPN. But I want to start with this first question with you. And that is, you went to Michigan and you got a degree (laughs) in political science and government. So how good has that degree come for you in terms of using it in your career? Good question. I don't think as much about the degree. I think about what school helped me learn and it helped me to learn how to learn and the systems and process you need to go through in order to acquire information, gain knowledge. So whether it was that major or the school as a whole helped me in that particular area. And I think it also helped me, maybe more so the school, I'll turn it to a story, is how I started in this business. I had a friend who was working at the local NBC affiliate in Detroit, WDIV. And she was a production assistant. And she was, for whatever reason, leaving the position And to this day, I really don't know why, but she recommended me to the news director. She had done a good job. So the news director assumed that the person she was recommending would also do a good job. And I got the opportunity to work there and relaying it back to school. School sort of helped me figure out you need to be proactive. You know, you can't just sit on your butt and wait for things to happen. And there were plenty of times in school while I was sitting on my butt waiting for things to happen. But I got in the door and you may have heard of, you know, in the door principle, you get in the door, take advantage of anywhere you're at. Once you get in the door, it's an open treasure chest. You can pursue any and all opportunities. And I got in the door in that position and developed a great relationship with the people in sports and helped out in that area. And that you know, one thing led to another and it led to a career. So more so, I think college helped me to focus on being proactive. Going back to that kind gesture that allowed you to get, as you said, your foot in the door, because that happened to you and because it has been so integral to your future success and how you flourished, How do you go back to that moment and how much do you put into it as far as why you are so devoted in building up others around you, mentoring so many? I think it's an organic aspect. I just think, um, I believe in three principles. And one is proactively curious, um, which I just explored. And I'll get to the, your answer you know, to what you just talked about. The second one is uh, learning the systems of where you're at. Once you master systems, you can change and improve them. And the third one is be a giver. One of the great books I read was The Go-Giver. Small, uh, I call it a toilet read. You can read it in one session, <laughs> but a quick, a quick read. But it, it, it led me to like, if you try to give to people organically, you're going to grow from it. You're going to grow uh, religiously, ethically, morally, financially in all aspects. So I think it would just, uh, it it just became an organic thing to try to help people because it was also capitalistic. It's helping me by helping others. And you've helped so many people. One of those has been Dick Vitale. And I saw this tweet where he was giving you some good praise. It wasn't long ago. And he talked about how lucky he was to work with you. 
What is he getting at there, Dan? I don't know. I really don't know. I think we're all lucky to touch Dick in some sort of way and take this opportunity to wish him the best in his fight that he's going through right now. Um, I don't know. It just, uh, I, I really, I, I don't know. We were just, uh, I made every effort to try to help him realize his abilities and uh, wanted to foster them as best we could, best I could. And uh, I really don't have an answer for you there. You know, I just uh, try to be as helpful as I can to. I think the answer to that is that you're very humble. And that's what I'm trying to get at with this conversation. Dan Steer is with me. I'm Brian Fenley. How have you been there for Dick Vitale in times of need and, and things that he's gone through? And you've always seemingly been there for him. I think it's just communicating and calling, staying in constant communication, not just with him, but something I noticed these days is I was a big believer. I remember I was speaking at a school and closing question was asked, you know, what's one piece of advice that you'd offer uh, graduates or kids that are graduating? I said, pick up the phone yeah. and, you know, calling people. And uh, I was really religious and staying connected with all the people that I work with from PAs to talent. Um, you get much more than just an email. You get much more from that than an email communication. So back to your question, I just made it, you know, I made sure before and after every game, I was communicating with him. And I try to do that a lot with the majority of the personnel that I had an opportunity to work with during the course of my career. And after games, what I've noticed about you, Dan, is that you are so good about giving back feedback whether it's talent, whether it's producers, along the lines of anybody who's a part of the broadcast, you are there. How do you make time for giving back feedback to so many people? And it certainly has enriched so many as well. I think it's, it's uh, I appreciate that people feel enriched. That's nice to hear. But I think it comes from dealing with situations maybe too quickly right away I think I'm guilty of reacting to situations immediately so they don't build up. You know, you don't end up getting like behind me a library of things that you have to follow up with. I tried to deal with it along the way. I also am a believer in writing it ugly and making it pretty. So I would write things down and try to follow up on them as soon as possible. What was, what was, easy in a way was when you were dealing with a specific sport over a finite period of time, you know, you could commit your, your time and effort to that particular sport. So if it was 16, 18 hour days, especially if it's something you're passionate about. So you, you just have to stay on top of it, commit your time to it. You know, I was very lucky at, at all the places to have opportunities to work on projects and then have time short or long to get myself, you know, or, rejuvenated to get going again, but it was a finite amount of time. And I just felt dealing with things right away. Don't let them build up. And then you hear the old adage, like if you're bothered by something, if you don't deal with it right away, it festers, right? You know, you get more annoyed by it. You need to address it and talk about it right away in a, you know, honest and matter of fact way and express yourself honestly. I really despise the word honestly. I get my kids all the time because you'll hear it all the time. Pay attention. You'll hear it all the time. People will say, well, honestly, I feel X or Y. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean the rest of the stuff is dishonest? Right. What people mean is I want to really stress this point to you. Right. So honesty, I just went on my uh, high horse. Let's get rid of the word honestly in conversation. A word that we are going to keep as we get rid of honestly in conversation, and this is actually a phrase, attention to detail. How have you been able to embody, or embody that, excuse me, in your work? Because I've talked to so many people who say that you are the spitting image of what attention to detail means, whether it's during a broadcast, 
afterwards. Everything has to be a certain way. And people appreciate that from you. Yeah, I think maybe to a fault at times, I get crit- I, I criticize myself. But I, as I was saying earlier, I try to, when I see things, I'll write them down to make sure that we follow up or I follow up on those particular things. So uh, I would say that's, that's the reason why I'm able to maybe pay more attention to detail. I know in my own life, if I don't write things down, I forget them. Maybe it's my age. So it's, as I said, writing it ugly and then making it pretty and following it up. What is one thing you will not forget that displays persistence that you've overcome or, had, or dealt with in your own career? Corniness is coming to my mind. I won't forget. <laughs> Literally, just uh, this is not where you want to go, but I won't forget working with just incredible people. Um, I'm trying to think about a situation. Maybe we continue to go. I'll think of something that pops yeah. in my head. But, uh, I don't have a specific response for you. I uh, What comes to mind is just being, you know, just, I feel really, how do you feel? Don't you feel lucky? I just feel really lucky in my life that I've had an opportunity to do what I've done and work with the people that I've been able to work with. That's not where you were going, but that's the response I'm giving you. The people who feel, and, and, and so many feel lucky to have worked with you over the years, they keep with them these Dan Steerisms, the, these phrases, phrases, the phraseology, if you will, of words that you've used to help get across points and help bring about your technique in a production truck. When you know that those are alive and well, all these years later, what does that mean to you? No, that makes me feel pretty good. No, it's nice. Nice to hear that. Um, but I hope, I hope people apply them. I hope they still are logical. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. One is um, think backwards. You know, especially when you're editing something or editing and condensing, say, highlights. Uh, the most important part of your highlight and of the game is usually, usually at the end of the game, when someone puts something together, they may spend too much time at the beginning and not recognize um, what happens at the end. But it makes me feel good to see that those things are still alive. I always say, you know, manage major moments. You know, I I remember 2005, 2006, 2007, I forget what it was, but someone asked me, Dan, you deal with all these games. How do you judge success? And I did not have an answer for the person like your earlier question. I couldn't figure it out. And then over the summer, I thought about it and I I, I made it a focus of the next year's um, campaign and seminar was managing major moments. You know, you're going to be judged really on how to handle the major moments in a broadcast. Yeah, you want to do a great job throughout, but how you handle the various major moments is how one judges the broad, broadcast, remember the broadcast. Um, again, typical of me, I've gone on to another tangent beyond your question. So. Dan Steer is with me. I'm Brian Fenley. I love the way your brain works, especially considering that, if I'm not mistaken, Dan, you put out this pamphlet where there are 17 different styles in order to do a highlight. What kind of brain and where were you when you constructed this list that seemingly is followed by everybody in sports casting today? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure it's followed by everybody, but I, I, it's, <laughs> it's funny. I was revisiting that because of this show that I was lucky enough to be a part of um, at the Olympics and revisiting the type of and approaches of highlights. And I don't really recall how and why I came up with that, but it was a spin 
on, you know, the black and white approach that anyone can take um, to putting together a particular highlight. So I like to look at things. I like to think of it as the non-line approach. People at a movie theater see a line, they get in a line. Not that I want to cut the line, but is there another way to avoid the line? What's another way to look at what we're doing in a creative fashion? So I think I was applying that non-line approach when I came up with these 17 laws. What made NBC think that you were first in line to bring on for the Winter Olympics? Um. Well, what, before I left NBC, this was going to be a show that I was a part of originally. Um, and they were aware of my past. Um, and I think, you know, maybe they, they were, they have a sense of who I am and my abilities and decided, hey, let's probably less of a risk to have Dan do it and hopefully he'll do a good job. Hopefully I did. When you look back, it's it's not been long since the Winter Olympics wrapped up. Where do you feel like you did the best work? Um, I think in cultivating our staff. And the group was fantastic both summer and winter. And I've always said a sign of success is when you feel you're not doing a lot, when everything runs smooth without your having to do a bunch. Sure, I did whatever, but it, it I thought it went really well and it was because of the staff and the way they uh, work with one another, create with one another. So I think just cultivating a group of people and uh, sort of setting them down a path to be successful. That's what I would recall. How often do you, Dan, let yourself reflect on what you've done? I've had a little bit more time to do that. I also feel like, I, I go back to what I said, Brian, I just feel like I've been lucky to be put in situations and other people would have achieved the same thing. You know, I think about this is uh, really uh, expressing a, a side of me here is I left college basketball in 2010 to take another opportunity with ESPN. And at the beginning, I sort of felt like, are, are they going to miss me? You know, maybe they'll miss me. And I watched the shows and I watched the sports now and they're excelling. They're doing great. And I sort of came to this conclusion, like, you know, I, I think I had an impact on that. So I want to root for them. You know, I want to root for everyone after me because I feel like I've influenced it in some small way. I sort of forget your question. I don't know why I went down this particular path. Ask me the question again. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I absolutely, as I pointed out, Dan, I love the way your brain works. It's made you so successful because the ideas that come through in stream of consciousness are, are beautiful yeah. ideas. And Dan Steer is with me. I am Brian Fenley. So yeah, you made the, you went from ESPN, ESPNU, NBC, and now just to, to kind of give people an idea of what you're doing, if I'm not mistaken, Steer Enterprises, you are working with different sports leagues, production-wise, strategy, in, in doing great stuff there. Obviously, you came on for the Olympics as well. But I wanted to ask you this. You mentioned how lucky you are, and you've used that word a lot. I also want people to realize that with that comes a lot of skill on your part. And part of that, the skill, is the way in which you reflect on yourself and how to get better and how to bolster the product of others. How hard can you be on yourself, Dan, because you are somebody who always wants greatness and wants others to succeed around you? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think early on in my career, I was very hard on myself. Still am a bit, you know, I wonder how you react to that same question. You know, things festered with me over time. 
time made it easier because I'd probably forget what made me upset. Um, I just, you know, I think now, especially as it relates to now and my, my dealing with my kids, it's a live and learn approach. It's a live and learn approach. A reality is I may, I may quit altogether at a sooner state, but I tell people, you know, the day you quit is the day you have a perfect show. So I think a lot of us in the business, I can think of my peers at ESPN or NBC, you know, we'll always find some things big or little that need to be improved. You may feel good about something, but inevitably you'll identify something that you can improve. And I think it's important to constantly seek improvement. Always see how you can do better. My mind right now is thinking, I'm doing this interview. I think I've given you some really stupid responses. Oh, no. So I'm thinking, okay, the next time I do an interview, I need to be conscious of doing X, Y, and Z. So continually try to improve, but don't beat yourself up. In the moment, you may do that. And then you got to wash it off and, and learn and go forward. You just said not to be hard on yourself, but your response right there was so hard on yourself and didn't need to be where you are self-critical of your answers. And if you go back and listen to this, Dan, so much better. And I'm, not going, I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, when your colleagues look at it, they're going to probably say, Dan, you were great. And I want to leave you with this final question. Dan Steer is with me. I'm Brian Fenley. So there's this constant throughout your life, this desire to improve. If you look at how you've improved as a father from becoming one to, to the years thereafter, where do you see that? I see that with a story in that uh, I've got four girls. They're all amazing. My wife's amazing. Um, my response to that is when we had our second child, my initial thought was just, this is just going to be the same as the first child. So as it relates to the kids, every day is different. Every kid is different. And you learn from each situation and each experience you do your best to try to not have the bad experiences get repeated. But in a way, you can't always control that. Hopefully you learn as a parent from your previous experiences and improve as a father, improve as a parent. Um, but you know what I find is you ask these questions, I go on a bit of a soliloquy and I forget the original <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, but I've I enjoyed, try to make you think. Yeah. I try to make you yeah. think. No, no, you do. You I do. don't want to throw at you, as you know, Dan, like, I don't want to throw out the cliche questions. I really no, you, want this to do. be meaningful you're, you're, for you. You know, you do a good job, Brian, in that you've done your research and you're reactive to the response. You try yeah. to craft your next question um, with something that happened in the answer. I always tell my yeah. kids, you know, if you're responding off of an interview, make sure you bring something up that you talked about within the interview. You know? I love how you mentioned that because I really do enjoy taking a word or a phrase from your last answer. Sure. And then listening to what you're saying. And at the same time, my brain is thinking, how can I take that word or phrase include that in my next question for you so that it seems like a, a seamless transition into the next question. Yeah. 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 I, 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 that's great. I agree. It's good. Let me ask you a question. Are you an Adam Morrison fan? I was wondering how long it would take for you to bring that up. I am. And so I recently had on, you are just the second guest I've had who has brought this up. You and Steve Ackles are the two that have brought this up. I am a huge Adam Morrison fan. And Dan, I might be one of only five people on this earth that has a Charlotte Bobcat Adam Morrison jersey. 
I think the other four people are probably from his immediate family, but I love the way he played college basketball and you were at the height of ESPN college basketball while, while he and JJ Redick were battling. I can't even One of the great games. Do you remember the Maui game against Michigan state triple overtime game? Was that Oh five or Oh six or Oh four? I forget. And I remember being in the truck in Maui. Wow. For that particular game, I was not producing, but I was in the truck. Uh, and I remember that, but I don't remember the year. Do you remember the year? I think it was 05 because that would have been the same year that they would have gone on and had that heartbreaking loss in the NCAA tournament yeah, to yeah, yeah. UCLA. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I'm sure you saw. And then to see that year and the way in which Adam. And then J.J. Redick, they were sort of like taking over the college basketball landscape. It seemed they to be were. a competition between yeah, both yeah, of yeah. them to yeah, one-up each great. other. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's great. It was great. Dan Steer, uh, I appreciate you. Thanks for doing this. Brian, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time with me. Appreciate it. Yeah, Dan Steer, certainly check out his work, ESPN, NBC, and then now Enterprises with Steer Enterprises, that is, as he looks over production for sports leagues, events, strategy, he does it all. And it was fun to talk about his career. I'm Brian Fanley. This is the On to Something podcast. Dan, appreciate you once again. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it.